<coughs> so, um, homework aid is due on Friday at noon, as I mentioned before. Uh, homework, uh, the, the project, stage four, is due on Thursday, the 21st of November, and uh, that's essentially the end of the project. You'll be finishing the project before Thanksgiving, so you can really enjoy Thanksgiving, relax, knowing that that project is complete and you're off the hook. Um, depending on HSB's interest in coming over here and hearing a presentation of your results, I may have a presentation of the results be like a homework assignment type value or something, but the project itself would end with your submission of the report that's going to go with stage four. I have to just sort of feel out what's going on at HSB. They've recently uh, gotten a new director and I just don't understand. I don't know whether their new manager is uh, as anxious to move forward with projects like this as their old one was, because their old one was really a big fan of it. Yeah? Will the uh, stage four be a printout that you want to turn in? We're going to, at the end of class today, I'm going to give you uh, the description of stage four and um, we'll talk about it in detail, but essentially it's a, it's a PDF submission that you'll be uploading to MU Online to include the report and four maps. Yes? Um, so we, yeah, we have uh, presentations for stage four out. I don't know if we do or not. Oh, okay. I have to talk to the folks at HSB oh, to find out if they oh, want to come over. Okay. Yeah, originally we were definitely scheduled to have a presentation, but okay. it's a little uncertain because they've got new management. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did they yeah. ever uh, give me any of that missing data? No, no, no missing data, which, which gives me uh, uh, a sense that maybe their new manager is focusing on other problems at the moment. We'll see. All right. So we'll talk more about the project after we discuss S-hydrographs. Um, before we launch into the discussion of S-hydrographs, do you have any questions related to the material that was covered in the recorded lectures? So we talked in the recorded lectures about unit hydrographs and the Snyder unit hydrographs. So specifically unit hydrographs where you've got a defined response to a one inch or a one centimeter storm. And then the Snyder unit hydrograph is a way of synthesizing a unit hydrograph when you don't actually have measured data for an area. It's a way of uh, empirically sort of guessing at what the response would be based on the area, the shape of the watershed, and other geographic parameters. So any questions related to that material? Yeah. Uh, when you were doing the Snyder example, uh -huh. uh, I don't think I exactly think what the like, W sub 50 and W sub 75. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's, let me go to that figure. Uh, w sub 50 is simply just the, uh, the width of the hydrograph where you have 50% of the peak flow rate. And there are some redundant geometric parameters that are defined here because if you know the height of the hydrograph, I mean, it's simply, it's just a triangle, right? So if you know how long the base is and you know how tall the height is, then the W75 and the W50 Aren't you don't strictly have to know them in order to define the shape of the hydrograph, but I think that they're seen to have some sort of just gee whiz meaning to the people who'd be interpreting the data, like what it, how long are you going to have half of the intensity of the peak flow rate? You know, if the peak flow rate is 100 CFS, then what will be the duration that you have 50 CFS? You can just think of it basically as how long a certain flow rate's going to be in place, where um, you know, the W70, the W100 is just instantaneous because it comes up to a peak and instantly starts going down again. Uh, these other Ws are, the width is referring to a duration. Good question. Yeah, John. <laughs> the standard duration, yeah. Well, uh, each, uh, each watershed has a, um, a storm that is going to equate to the time of concentration. And so the standard rate, you know, like a, a small watershed where the time of concentration isn't necessarily, now this is something that came up in the exam. A lot of people said that the time of concentration is where a raindrop falls from the furthest point and makes its way towards the outlet. And that's pretty close to true, but it's not exactly true. It's not distance-wise the furthest, but it's time-wise the furthest. And so if there was, just by happenstance, if there was a stream channel that went all the way here, so that a raindrop falling here has to only travel overland for 
very shortly, and then it gets into a channel where the flow is moving quick, that wouldn't necessarily be the, uh, the point that defines the time of concentration. And so maybe something has to flow over land here a long time, and then it gets into the channel. So first of all, I want to clarify that time of concentration is a time related concept rather than a distance. Now, having said that, the standard duration is related to the, con the, the time of concentration. Um, when you're generating a synthetic unit hydrograph, you don't necessarily know exactly what the, uh, the time of concentration is because you don't know all of the slopes inside of a watershed. You don't know where the, um, you don't know where the streams are. And so it's sort of like the, the fake guess at the time of concentration. It's a synthetic version of it. Other questions? <laughs> All right. <coughs> <coughs> so what we're going to talk about today is S hydrographs. And the reason for S hydrographs, it's a procedure that is designed to um, change the duration of a unit hydrograph storm. And uh, in the Tuesday lecture of last week, it talked about a unit hydrograph where there's a unit of rainfall excess, meaning if our units are traditional, an inch of rainfall excess, or if our units are SI, a centimeter of rainfall excess. And ordinarily, what we'd say is that that one inch fell during some certain time frame. Maybe it's an inch occurred during a one hour time period. Well, uh, other times we will have the data in periods other than one hour. So it might be that we have a rain gauge that's measuring every four hours. And so what if we had the, we're trying to figure out what the unit hydrograph looks like for a watershed. And we know the, the runoff during a four hour time period. And we know how much rainfall excess there was during that four hour time period. But now we want to know what is the watershed going to do during storms of other durations besides just the four hour one that we already have data for. Uh, this S hydrograph procedure is a way of us changing a hydrograph that we do have data for into a storm duration that we don't have data for. And so it's a transformation procedure that's actually pretty simple that allows you to uh, change the rainfall excess duration. So let's say here, for example, that you've got a hydrograph for a two hour storm, but you want one for a four hour storm. These are uh, assigned the variables T sub R for the uh, storm duration that you do have data for, and T prime R is the storm duration that you don't have data for. Uh, and so the, uh, the S curve procedure, basically what you do is have a hydrograph that says if there's a storm that has a certain amount of rainfall intensity, and we assume it's a constant rainfall intensity that's um, during the, the period T sub R. Um, so it's the same amount of rainfall during the two hour time period and it causes this first hydrograph. Well, what if you just repeated it over and over and over? And so you can see here that there is several different hydrographs, one after another, and they're lagged by two hour increments. Uh, if you add up the sum of all those flows, it comes to eventually plateau, and this is called the S-curve because of its shape. The transformation procedure is, first of all, to create an S-curve by repeating the hydrograph over and over and over. So we're going to create an S-curve, and then we're going to lag the S-curve by T prime R. So in this example, we're going to have, in the spreadsheet format, some S-curve that's just the sum of lots of these original unit hydrographs. Then we're going to have that in a column. The next column over is going to be that same hydrograph, the same S-curve, but it's going to be just delayed. It's going to be dragged down a couple of cells equal to T prime R. And in this example we're going to work, the T prime R that we want is four hours. And so we'll have in the column next to the S-curve column, another S-curve with the same shape, the same numbers, but just four hours lower on the spreadsheet. Then in the third column, we're going to do a subtraction of the S-curve from the original S-curve, the lagged one from the original. And then 
what you need to do is because there's a volume discrepancy that arises out of this procedure, you have to divide by the ratio of T prime R to T sub R. Now, it doesn't make any sense necessarily when you just see the procedure like that, but it will make sense conceptually when you see the result of the transformation procedure. And before we actually start the calculations, let's just try and figure out what we'd expect these values to be. Here's a two-hour unit hydrograph. This means that one inch of rainfall uh, came onto the, one inch of rainfall excess came onto the uh, watershed area during a two-hour time period. And so between zero and two is when the rain actually fell. And then the water makes its way from the watershed towards the outlet, and you can see that it comes to a peak of 389 CFS for that one inch of rainfall excess, and then it starts declining again. So if you have that same one inch, but it is spread over four hours instead of two hours, would you expect that the peak is going to be higher or lower in intensity? What would you think? If it's going to be the same one inch, but instead of being spread over the watershed during two hours, it's taking four hours. So let me just draw a watershed here. Okay, so what we have here is it, during two hours, think about one inch of rainfall is being sprinkled over this watershed during a two-hour time period. And this watershed has some uh, channels in it. Two hours, one inch of RE, rainfall excess. And this is the response. So now we have the same watershed, and there's no way I'm going to get that again. Let's see. Uh, not so bad. All right. <coughs> we got four hours, one inch of rainfall excess. Okay, so it's the same volume, but it's a longer period of time. And so what does that tell us about the hydrograph? If this was the hydrograph, and it looks like the time to peak here was eight hours, and the height of the peak was 389. How would you expect the, uh, the time to peak to shift, Jacob? Lower and later in the storm. That's right. Because if you think about it, during the first two hours, it's only going to get half an inch of rainfall excess. And then during the second two hours, there's going to be another half inch of rainfall excess. And so in a way, what we're doing is we're doing the, uh, the unit hydrograph two times, but they're going to be in separate time periods. And it's not so easy as just uh, as having the unit hydrograph once during the 0 to 2 and then a second time during 2 to 4 uh, because uh, of the additive effect. So the S, the S procedure is going to allow us to do that. So go ahead and fire up your spreadsheets. And uh, as a first step, copy this data. You'll have one column with time, one column, two-hour unit hydrograph, and the units there are CFS per inch. And what we're expecting is that the hydrograph here is going to be, the peak will be less than 389. And that the time to peak we're expecting will be longer than eight hours. How could you take something so perfect?
All right. So has everybody got that data keyed in there? We'll need them and probably more than that. We don't have to add them now necessarily. Because of, uh, because of the lagging procedure we're going to do. So the first thing we have to do is create the S-curve. And the way that we create the S-curve is just by repeating the unit hydrograph over and over and over. So here is the unit hydrograph. And I'm just going to paste it down here and there and there. And the way I know that if I've done it enough times is it, it will, appre it will um, approach a plateau. So the S-curve is just the repetition of the unit hydrograph several different times, um, an infinite number of times. But we won't do it an infinite number of times. We'll maybe do it like uh, 10 columns or so. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'll do it two more. All right. And now I'm going to make these really narrow so that I can see more on a page at once. And then this is the S-curve. It will be the sum of all of the columns to the left of it. So does it reach a, uh, a plateau? Maybe not exactly. Um, I might need to repeat it a couple of more times. And adjust my formula to include the new columns that have been added. Drag that down. Oh, it doesn't have the thing where you can just double click on the edge here. How about that? Yeah, they've removed all the feet, all the goodies. The old Excel would let me do it. Yeah, it's an add-on. Okay, so here it plateaus. Here's evidence of it: is that it's 2015 was the uh, the highest it's going to get, and so it plateaus there. And we don't have to have it plateau forever. It starts tapering back down towards zero, and that's fine as long as we reach that plateau and can confirm it. How do you do this? And maybe you don't see it, but it, you can still do it. All right. Got it? Oh, yeah, all right. It's definitely there. You're getting it? Good. All right, so the next step is that we're going to take a copy of this S-curve, and we're going to lag it by T prime R. So it says in the instructions here, lag by T prime R. In our case, we want to have the duration to be four hours. And so each one of these is two hours. Each one of these rows represents two hours. So we're going to lag the S-curve. Here's a copy of it. Control C. I'm going to lag it, not here, because that would just be lagging at two hours. But if I put it here, um, paste doesn't work as I would want. Let me do paste values. And there is the, uh, there's the S-curve lagged by T prime R, which is four hours. <coughs> Previously, when I did control C and then control V, I think it would just paste the, the numbers. But enough of my tiresome complaining about Excel 2013.
be sure that you have a paste the values. We want the actual numbers of that S curve. So I'm going to call this column uh, S curve lagged by T prime R. And finally, we're going, well not finally, the penultimate step, uh, step three, is to perform a subtraction. So it is the, uh, the lagged S-curve is being subtracted from the original S-curve. And so subtracted, uh, lagged S-curve from original S-curve. So equals, and all these are 0 too. So equals that minus that. And when it goes negative here, we can just ignore all this mumbo jumbo after, uh, after it goes through its cycle of uh, up to the plateau and then down again. S-curve is just the sum of everything. So in this column, oh. yeah, you can do is like sum of all of that, and then when you drag it down, it's going to start like adding all of those things. Should I just put zeros in? <laughs> no, you don't need them. No, they're not. They're not necessary. Oh, okay. So you can just do equal sum and then okay. highlight. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, so okay. do that. Do equals yeah. sum, and then yep, print yep, and then highlight all of the cells. B through N. Yeah. And enter. Okay, and then if you drag that formula down, keep going all the way. Yep. Yep. All right, good. So there's your, this is the S curve. Okay. And so copy it. Now control C will copy it. And then Four hours later, Four hours so later, yep, next yeah, in the next column, okay. now go down two cells, yeah. uh, paste there, no. Control V, okay. or paste, yeah, paste numbers, okay. uh, but we want to paste the numbers, so go here, oh, okay, uh, this yep, hour, yep, and uh, paste values where it says one, two, three. one, two, three, yep, all right, so now that's paste the values, so you've got the S curve, the lagged S curve, and then in the next column, subtract the two. Nope, starting at the very top. Oh, starting at the very top. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so equals, equals mm -hmm. subtract uh, this value. Yep, exactly. That, you, yeah, it's okay if it's blank. So that minus that. Okay. Oh, okay, it's okay. It's yeah, it doesn't matter. It'll uh, assume it's zero. Enter. Uh-huh. Okay. And now drag that down. You can just double click it. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Maybe you got to drag it down one, and then you can double click it, or two. Drag it down one more. There it goes. All right. Okay. Now you're. Uh, so we've done the subtraction. We uh, we don't really care about where it goes negative. The last step is that we have to divide by t prime r divided by t sub r. So here, our uh, values of interest. We had t r was um, 2 and T prime R was 4. 
And so then the ratio T prime R divided by T R is, I got to do this on Excel. It's really complicated. All right, got it. So the last step is divide this subtracted column by the ratio of T prime R. So this is the lagged, no, no, um, the, the basically the, what this is is going to be the four-hour unit hydrograph. So this is the, the final result will be that divided by this ratio. And it'll be interesting to see if it meets our expectations. Remember, we had certain expectations for what this hydrograph was going to do relative to the original. <coughs> because I'm so, so many columns away, I'm going to copy the time from over here. And I'm going to also have it over here just as a special bonus. Now it's on both sides. We said we thought it would be lower and later than eight hours. And so instead of 389, we're seeing it's 370, so that's good. And the peak is at 10 hours instead of eight hours. And so you know, physically and conceptually, it seems to be behaving in a way that's consistent with what we know about hydrology. which isn't always how some of these procedures work out, but in this case it is, so that's good. I ought to put proper units on this, the four unit, hour unit hydrograph, and it is CFS per inch. And so the interpretation of this is if there was an inch of rainfall that fell an inch of rainfall excess, excuse me. Remember, rainfall excess is after the abstractions have been satisfied and uh, whatever is going to go to infiltration has, um, has been used up. So we've got an inch of rainfall excess that's entering the watershed over four hour period. And this is going to be the watershed's response to it. So in the homework, you've got SI units, no big deal. And you're starting off with a four-hour unit hydrograph, and you need to come up with an eight-hour unit hydrograph. So same basic steps. Did everybody get a copy of the homework? I don't understand why I have so many extra copies of it. I must have printed too many. I guess that's why. Everybody's got one, right? Any questions about the spreadsheet? All right, I think we got it. We'll move on to talk about the project now. Um, by the way, on Thursday is when we're going to start learning about the NRCS method. And that's, you're going to start feeling like the kings of the universe once you know the NRCS uni uh, method. It, uh, it allows you to predict things in a really powerful way and just all of a sudden like uh, predictions start matching reality and uh, it's, it's really strong stuff. I'm excited to show it to you and especially when we get in to start using WMS because it allows you to apply the NRCS method in, in an automated way and make use of GIS data and I mean you'll be learning stuff that you genuinely could get paid for and so that's always exciting to teach you something that's like a valuable marketable skill and we'll start that on Thursday. Yeah watershed modeling system. It's a software program. It, you, you may remember that you had that homework problem where you had to manually delineate an area, you know, just by looking at the ridge line. And then I demonstrated that there's this program that can use the uh, elevation mapping to automatically delineate it. WMS is that program that I use. But delineating a watershed area is 0.01% of what it can do. So it's a great program.
program. All right. So hydrographs, we, we've got that figured out. We're going to leave it there for today and uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the project. Now, here's just a summary. You've got the slide in your notes. <coughs> It's a summary of the process that we went through. So if you want to refer to this as you're doing the homework assignment, we created the S-curve, lagged it, uh, divided the subtracted result by the ratio, and then had the, the answer there. All right. Uh, first thing, I'm going to review a couple of maps because it, it occurs to me that uh, some of you may not have seen what other student groups have been submitting, and I wanted to point out a few things that I thought were really good. Now, I've already provided the comments. Um, I've entered the grades and typed in comments into MU Online, and have any of you managed to see the comments there? They are visible. It's not like just throwing it out there to the ether. If you have a partner, you may need to, like, email them the comments, because I could only enter if only one of you sub uploaded something, that's fine, but it doesn't give me the option to provide a comment if there wasn't an upload submission, okay? So, um, <coughs> share the, <coughs> excuse me, share the, uh, uh, the comments with your partner. All right, I wanted to show some, uh, some good stuff. Uh, let's see here. First of all, I liked this submission because it seemed like, just from the, uh, from the view of it, that some pretty careful attention had been paid to the catchment boundaries. Now, I don't know necessarily if that was based on elevation data or walking through the project area, but it implies, you know, the fact that it's not a straight line, that, that it's curved sort of implies, wow, they're really uh, splitting hairs there, trying to figure out exactly where the water is going. So I'd like to think that that's, that that's an actual data point and not just being silly or maybe poor tracing. I, I hope that, that, that those areas are genuine there, because if so, I'm really impressed. Um, now let's talk about some other stuff to here, here too. Um, so the dark green, it's not that you set that as dark green, that's just that there's two catchment areas on top of each other, right? And um, think about what that's saying, is that uh, it's saying that the rainfall is going to go on to the, the big area. The, the big area flows towards the street level catch basins. So for example, this big area here is flowing presumably towards this catch basin. That's probably the road. And all the flow we're saying is going to make it towards the road. Um, the flow of this roof area is going to make it to this catch basin. And that, that's not an actual catch basin. Obviously, that's something that you have to define so that the roof area has a way of entering the network. We both know that. But what the program doesn't know is that since this, catch, this catchment is here, it doesn't know to subtract that area from the large area underneath it. And so you're going to have to manually subtract that. You're going to have to come up with user-defined areas. Maybe that's something you already recognized. If not, what I'm saying is you'll need to go into the tables, and you know how there's a user-defined length? You can like user define certain things. It'll calculate the area based on where you click on the map. But what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to say when all of these, let's see, what's connected inside of this boundary, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. If, well, maybe not that one. Um, so five that appear to be connected to the combined sewer. When all five of those are connected, you're going to have to subtract their roof area from the, uh, from the area that goes to this street level catch basin here. Um, but during the project, you're going to be like disconnecting progressively more of those roof drains. And so not only is the area going to be changing, but so is the C value. Because right now, like what is this area? What does it consist of? It's grass maybe a little bit of walkway. Um, presumably, there are garages, like separate garages in that area. And the, I don't think that ordinarily the garages are connected to the combined sewer. Is that right? Just a handful of them. All right, so what you've got here is you're going to be saying, let's sever the link between this house and the combined network. And so now all of the flow of this house is going to have to be added to the flow 
at the ground level that's making it towards this catch basin. And so it's going to be excluded from entering the network here, and it's going to be entering the network instead much further down. Um, so that's something you just have to manage manually um, by, by reducing the user-defined area of, well, increasing the user-defined area under here from the baseline condition. The baseline condition, when you start without any disconnections, you're going to have to decrease the area lower than what it is calculated just by, based on where you clicked. You're going to have to subtract out all of these. Does that make sense to everybody? Does everybody have a question about what I'm saying? Yes? Uh, well, just a question. Um, we, weren't, we were in the process of developing these catchments. Um, it's primarily due to where the elevation is such that it contributes to the surface of flow. Yeah. So like I noticed like with First Avenue, it kind of, it, that's, it tends to uh, slope downward towards the, the uh, alley more than, you know, uh, yeah. the neighborhood or uh, those blocks adjacent to uh, Collis Avenue. So that's what we would uh, have done. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's the elevation data that you can sort of uh, figure out by tracing your cursor over Google Earth. Uh, there's looking at the curbs. That can tell you how the water is flowing. You can sort of go out to the project site and say, all right, if it rains here, the curb is going to be a boundary and it's going to force flow a certain direction. Um, you can go out there when it's raining and sometimes that will give you an even better impression. Are there other... Uh, other ways you figured out where to put the the boundaries? Other people want to chime in on clues that they use to figure out? Yeah. <coughs> That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like a linear interpolation of where was the yeah, that's a good idea. Yes, Jacob. Hmm. All right. Um, I have a program um, for running. It's a watch, a satellite watch, and it follows where you go. And when you plug it into the computer afterwards, it will tell you what the elevation profile is that you were walking on. So um, you could put on the watch and just go walk around in circles in the project area and then uh, get maybe the map uh, elevations off of that. But it's probably the underlying elevation data is no more accurate than Google Earth. So. Well, it claims to be accurate to a hundredth of a mile. Oh, elevation-wise, well, I think it, it displays elevation in in ten, tens of feet. Like when I do a run, it'll say, you know, like the elevation difference was 2,400 feet or something. Okay. All right. Um, so I liked this because it looked like some thought had been put into the boundaries. And there were others that also had... Uh, obviously been very detailed. I mean, uh, very detailed shapes of the roof areas. And um, you know, this wasn't the only group that I thought was a good example of it. But I thought that it was unique in that it had these tracings to try and uh, really nail down the areas. Uh, another thing that I thought was good was the annotations on this file. You know, I know it's really hard to cram so many uh, so much data into the annotations. And the strategy that this group took was instead of having it stacked to move the annotations out laterally. And so let me show you what I mean by that, moving it laterally. Maybe I've zoomed in a bit much. There we go. All right. So instead of having all of the attributes stacked on top of, of each other, um, this group had like the this must be like the center line of where it would put it. And so if it was stacked, they'd all just be on top of it. But they had the name of it being center and up a little bit, the length, center and down, uh, the diameter, 
up a little bit to the left, the material type up a little bit to the right. So it sort of avoids the problem of the annotations being on top of the pipeline, because in some cases, actually, the red annotation was coincident with the red pipe, and so you're missing some of the text because of that. And in other cases, the text was just like in a row so tall that then it gets in the way of the next pipe. Now, I know it's nearly an impossible task to fit so much data into an 11 by 17, and it didn't occur to me until uh, I was reviewing these that there's really no reason that the, uh, that the paper size should be set to 11 by 17. I mean, you might as well say it's a 30 inch by 40 inch because I'm not going to print them. I'm just going to look at them electronically. And so what I've told you to do for the final submission of stage four is use any paper size that you want um, to help you make those annotations look clear. And I think one of the great strategies that you can use that was demonstrated by this group was to um, have, the, um, have the text spread out laterally. So do you have any questions? I don't remember what group this was precisely, but do you have any questions on how they did certain things or do you want to ask them for advice? I'm sure that they'd speak up and admit to their excellence if anybody has a specific question for them. Yeah. <laughs> this was? Why didn't you use the F the offsets? I don't understand what you mean. What's that? Oh yeah. Rotate the text. When you when you highlight a body of text, if you right click, it gives you the option to rotate it. So how long did that take? Like annotation. How long did your how long did it take to make your annotation look neat? Seriously, like how many hours? <laughs> two hours. Two hours. What well, was two hours well spent? in my opinion. <laughs> because this is something that uh, down the line you're going to feel proud. And when you show your children, you know, and maybe when I say we, uh, we're not going to print these out, you know, we've got that ginormous printer that does really large format prints. And um, if HSB does decide that they want to come up here for a presentation, maybe we'll print out some of them. So. Yeah. You know, last year they were very receptive and as they said at the uh, the kickoff meeting at the beginning of the semester, they actually went into the field and changed some pipes around as a result of the student project. So, um, I mean, I think that was a, a proof of the concept of having students do work for them is that they realized that one of their catch basins that should have been closed off wasn't. So, hopefully they, they come out here. <laughs> yes. Huh? <laughs> Automatic design? Well, um, that's a good question. So you're thinking of the Darwin designer. Yeah, the Darwin designer. The thing where you said, here's how much each pipe costs. Go ahead and make it for me. Um, no, I don't think that there is. And, uh, and in, that, in this case, that's not so much of a problem because we're not trying to design the network so much as just analyze it. Oh, okay. And so I'm not asking you to go in and tell me how, much, how big each pipe should be. I'm asking you to tell me instead, um, what does it take for each of these pipes to fail? You know, like under certain scenarios, how many of the pipes are failing and so on. We'll talk about the experimental mat matrix in a minute. But there isn't the automated designer and that's, it turns out, not, not a problem. All right, uh, last thing is uh, you don't necessarily have to have all of the houses have their own pipe into the network. It, that is the most accurate thing to do, is to build a lateral for each house. Um, but it is also okay to group houses together. And so I thought that this group, these people, I don't want group, grouping houses and a group of people, but uh, the people who worked on this did a nice job of, you know, here's two properties that are entering the network together, and it'll be easy as they are doing the experimental analysis to say, well, we're going to disconnect just in a 20% disconnect. That means you've got a certain number of houses in the project area. 
Maybe if you have uh, 20 houses, then in a 20% disconnect, you're going to remove four of them from being disconnected. And so strategically, just you know, remove one here, remove one here, later on down the network, remove one, and so on. So um, this group did a nice job of uh, combining properties. You know, there weren't too many. Last year, there were, um, like, some of the groups would put, like, eight or ten houses together entering one lateral. And that really results in a loss of acuity when you're having ten houses join the network all at once. It's sort of like um, not, not a very realistic representation of what's really happening in the pipe network. And you can't sort of point to where the pipe is failing quite so evenly as you can if you have a reasonable distribution like this is. All right. So those are just a couple of examples I thought were, were worth pointing out. Um, let's talk about some additional information here. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I really got to stop smoking, right? Uh, <laughs> during class, I mean. All right. Um, we're going to assume that, uh, that there's 140 gallons per person per day being generated for wastewater. And that's uh, based on the Huntington Sanitary Board itself. Their long-term control plan assumes a wastewater generation rate of 140 gallons per person per day. That's the average flow over the course of the day for an average day. So sometimes when it's a daily flow rate, it's hard to think about an instantaneous flow rate. And so what that turns out to be is uh, 2.17 times 10, <coughs> excuse me, 10 to the minus fourth CFS per person. Um, what you're going to need to do, though, is peak that. And remember, we talked about peaking and the reason for peaking in hydraulics. And we're going to assume that the storm, the design storm, happens at that 8 o'clock p.m. on the day of the year that people are generating the most wastewater. And uh, there are some factors given for different population sizes. And for our network, we'll assume that the peak ratio is 6. So that really what you need to do is have 6 times that for each person. How many people? I'll leave that to you to uh, assume how many people are living in each of the homes in your network. And I think that it's not strictly just a residential area as well. I think that there may be some commercial places and uh, industrial facilities that need to be accounted for in terms of this additional wastewater flow that's going to be added into the network. Additional flow. Let me show you how to account for additional flow. So we've got our project area. I, I just made the, the simplest network that you could have. One catchment connected to one catch basin with an outlet. And by the way, your networks need an outlet. There were several groups that didn't have outlets. And so the water has to be going towards somewhere. And um, it's, it's not a random thing. You just it, The last pipe in the network that you're considering, at the end of it, add an outlet and uh, make the outlet low enough that that pipe is not the, uh, the critical factor that's causing failure in the network. We're just going to ignore what's downstream of that and focus in only on the network inside the project area. So here what I've got is a, catch, a catchment that's associated with a catch basin, and I've defined some elevation so that there's slope going towards the outlet. Now, the additional flow can be added. You know, this wastewater, here, I'm going to show you where you should put the wastewater. In the flex tables for the catch basin, the additional flow, flow additional, that's it. So going back to uh, one of these maps that we were looking at just a minute ago. All right, so if, if I'm talking about this house going into the network there, you know, I assume there's four people in that house. I calculate the per capita flow rate. So I want to add um, an additional one CFS 
into that catch basin. Um, that's really the only thing I'm going to have to add for the catch basin. Now previously I already defined in the uh, here in the catchment I already defined what the time of concentration was. You know, I think that it's 0.2 hours for the flow to get from the edge towards the boundary. Uh, I've already defined the precipitation. Remember, precipitation, now I've got a video that I'm going to show you the link to in a minute that goes from a blank screen through an entire simulation. So if you don't remember exactly how to put the precipitation data in, I've got a recording that shows you that. Um, but you can define that in the, um, no, not the calculation, yeah, storm data. I defined an IDF table here under Hydro 35. I put in the two-year and the 100-year storms for 5, 15, and 60. I got this data, let's say, from the um, precipitation frequency data server. So I put that in. It knows what the rainfall looks like in the area. It knows what the time of concentration is. It knows what the C value is because I made an assumption based on tables that are published and my inspection of the area, what a reasonable C value is for this catchment. And so it's going to have both a stormwater flow and the additional flow. So when I click on compute, it's going to tell me both. Uh, when I pull up the pipe, the, the conduit table, it's got the rational flow. That rational flow is just based on Q equals CIA. And then it's also got the flow. So let me move this over so that we can compare them. The rational flow and the flow aren't the same. The system rational flow is the rainwater. And then flow includes the rainwater plus this additional amount that's accounting for the sewage. Capacity is just Manning's equation. It used Manning's equation knowing the slope of the pipe, the roughness, the diameter of it. And so right now, the pipe has not failed. And uh, there's an option here to show the percent full. Yeah, I think percent. Oh, is it already there? There it is. Fl yeah, it's the ratio of flow to capacity. So I'm 50% full. And so now let's say that um, I disconnected the roof from the, uh, from the combined network. And so now there's some roof that used to be going somewhere else entering here. So that would both increase my area of the, of the catchment, and it's also going to increase the C value. And so now my area is going to go up, because this is like, let's say, a street level flow. So now once the uh, roof area comes into play, instead of one acre, maybe I've got now 1.2 acres. And the C value goes up from 0.7. I've got some more impervious area there, because of the, uh, the roof that's been added. Maybe if I do my calculations on a little piece of paper and I find that the weighted average C value is going to go to 0.78. And then I can compute that again and uh, find out how the pipe is doing now. Look at the ratio. What you're going to do is you're going to examine certain scenarios. Now I'm at 67% of capacity. You're going to examine certain scenarios and find out with this experimental matrix what's happening during each of these conditions. <coughs> right now, under present conditions, when you know, some of these houses are connected, some of them are disconnected and flowing over the land towards the, str the street level catch basins, what happens during a one-year storm? And when I mean what happens, I mean how many of the pipes in the network are failing? You know, you'll go through the report, you'll go through the conduit table, 
and find out, count how many of the pipes are above 100% for a one-year storm. Hopefully a one-year storm isn't causing a lot of failure. Um, and you'll look at maybe how bad, you know, like where are some of the key areas that are failing over and over again. Let me give you the handout that describes part four. Now I've got it in bold here on the first page that this last part I'd like you to do individually. Now, for setting up the network till now, it's been a, a group effort. If you'd like, you could have worked with a partner to set up the network. But I want everyone to get their own individualized experience doing the analysis. And so everybody has to submit their own independent analysis. Now, you can continue to talk to other students in general terms about what are you doing on the project? You know, how do you use water? How do you use StormCAD? Um, what about this pipe over here? Are the elevations given in the GIS data wrong? You can talk in general terms, but everyone needs to do their own analysis. What I'm showing here is the experimental matrix. And the things that you should assess for each one of the blanks in the experimental matrix is how many pipes are failing, which pipes fail soonest. Like, wh try and identify the hot spots. What's the problem area? Is there a particular pipe that has a very shallow slope that consistently is failing? Um, and then um, after going through and analyzing all of the steps before this, this last row of strategic disconnection, that's where you finally get to do a little bit of design. Because like I was mentioning to Chris earlier, this is mostly an analysis project. It's not a design project. The network's already in the ground. And so you're just trying to figure out how does it perform under certain conditions. Now, after looking at how it's failing and you know, even when you have 100% of the roof drains disconnected, there may be some pipes that still continue to fail. And what you can do is you could identify those as the pipes that ought to be retrofitted first. And so you can try and uh, redesign those hot spots that you identify and say what pipe diameter it ought to be or maybe the slopes should be adjusted or whatever you think is appropriate. Any questions about the experimental matrix? So the one-year storm through the 25-year storm. I won't ask you to analyze how the system behaves in the 100-year storm because we wouldn't expect it to really be able to handle flows like that. The first year that we did the project, um, the, the network was failing for the one-year storm even if 100% of the homes were disconnected. There was nothing that could be done to salvage the network. Last year, um, what we found was that 80% disconnection would more or less solve the problem. If they could convince 80% of the residents to disconnect, then things would basically be fine. So for the values for the storm, split off a lot for the two and the 100-year storm? If you define it for the two-year storm and the 100-year storm, you can go into the Hydro 35 part of um, storm cabinet. and it'll interpolate everything else. Yeah, right. Yeah. <coughs> Other questions about the experimental matrix? You can, you can ask other questions. You know, as, please read through the assignment in detail. But one of the things I mentioned is that you don't have to limit yourself to counting how many pipes fail and which pipes are failing the worst or fail soonest. You can try and look at it other ways. And, uh, in previous semesters, other students have, uh, have asked additional questions besides these that were pretty instructive in trying to assess the health of the network. Like you could, you could say, you could look at a blockage scenario. Like if, if one of the pipes hasn't been um, maintained the way that it ought to, if, if there's some sedimentation in a pipe, what's going to happen? That would be a pretty interesting thing. You know, if, if you say that there's a loss of diameter, of a, you know, two-inch loss of diameter due to sedimentation, how does the network begin to perform and so on? You know, really flat pipes are the ones that those are at, at, at the greatest risk of sedimentation. Just to let you know, it's, you know the, the pipes that are flat have low velocities and don't scour and cleanse the way that they ought to. I don't know. We'll have to go in. Into the, um, into the field and see if there's any hints. I don't know what it means. Yes, John. So 
that's talking about the number of homes. And now, we don't have really that many homes compared to, uh, let's say, how many homes are there? Like 50? 60? We're talking about like if, so in 20% disconnection, of the ones that are connected right now, 20% you, instead of having their roof drains going into the combined network, their roof drains are dumping into their yard. In 100% disconnection, everybody is now dumping the water into their yard instead of into the combined network directly. 20% disconnection is 20% of the homes that are connected now, not the, of all of the homes. We're only concerned with the baseline condition, which is now, and so starting with where we are now, disconnect 20 of those that are currently connected. All right, here's an important tip is you're going to get error messages as you run the simulation if you don't have the, the inlet location in SAG. It's going gonna, it's gonna to whine that you haven't told it about the gutters. We're not going to bother uh, with the surface flow like drawing a gutter network. It's complicated enough having the pipe network. And so let me show you what the error message looks like if the, the catch basin location is not in the SAG. So here in the catch basin table, the place that we've defined the location is here, inlet location. By default, it'll say on grade as the inlet location, meaning that, uh, you know, it's just a normal catch basin along a road. And so it wants to try and calculate what percent of the water is going to make it into the inlet. It has a way of doing that. So that if you, uh, if you tell it to calculate when it's on grade, you get a, re a red exclamation point and you won't actually get any flows. But if instead you go into the catch basin and you tell it that the inlet location is in a sag, that means assume that the inlet location is at a low point in the, uh, in the area. So you don't have to tell it necessarily what the, uh, what the curb looks like. So once you define it as in a sag, then you don't get that red exclamation point and it actually does start to calculate the flows. So that's an important uh, additional note there. We've already talked about where you're going to put the wastewater in. Um, I've provided some tips about how to make annotation and printing look good. This is actually related to last year's project in hydraulics. It, so it's a WaterCAD video, this first one for printing. But uh, for a lot of the Bentley products, the scaling and optimization for printing, like changing the margins and so forth, are still valid. And uh, here's the video that starts with a blank page and goes through all of the steps required to uh, execute a model, setting it up and executing it. So if you just need to remind yourself, for example, how to put in the precipitation data, this is the link that you can use to, uh, to remind yourself how to key in the IDF table. Any questions about the project? So over Thanksgiving, I'll be reviewing your projects and you'll be thinking about them and telling your relatives and it'll be the talk of Thanksgiving. All right, well, let's just remind ourselves about uh, the announcements for today. Essentially, it's that the homework is due. The homework that I've handed out, homework eight, is due on Friday at noon. Yeah. So, do I'm going to have to look and see at the topics. Yeah, we're uh, we're doing a few things on the fly. So, I'll let you know in the next class. <laughs>